have set the recording. Let me start. I'll start it right at uh, 11, give you as much time as possible. Starting now. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the DBA Fundamentals Virtual Chapter Meeting for April. Uh, today we have Aaron Stilato, uh, kick, uh doing a presentation entitled Kicking and Screaming, Replacing Profiler with Extended Events. Um, this one's going to be a good one for me because I still haven't totally went over to it. Anyway, um, I'm Steve Cantrell. I'm the uh, leader, co-leader of DBA Fundamentals. And our sponsor uh, is uh, SQL Sentry. And this month they're starting uh, with a execution plan contest. Um, basically, uh, you download a copy of their free Plan Explorer, which is a great free tool, and it's totally, you don't have to give your email address or anything, and if you find a really, really bad query that's got just this just wild execution plan, you can anonymize your um, execution plan. It'll change all the values, and you can send it in to them. And I'm not sure exactly of all the details. You can get the details on their site. You can uh, uh, click at the top right-hand side of your screen, and you can make a copy of what's on the screen. So you can copy all these links, and uh, you can enter that contest. The past uh, Board of Director elections is going to be in September. And like last year, they want to make sure that everybody has updated their uh, MyPass profile. So you're eligible to vote if you've updated your MyPass profile by June the 1st. So go do that after this meeting if you haven't already done so. And be sure that it's totally filled out. Um, that way you'll be eligible to vote in September because it's important to uh, be able to uh, elect the people that are going to do the best job for us. Past Business Analytics Conference is coming up in May. I think it's too late to get any of the, the discounts um, at this point, but um, you can uh, go to passbaconference.com and register uh, for any uh, um, people that are interested in that. PASS has tons of different virtual chapters. Uh, I'm sure you see this on other sessions. Uh, are from other chapters if you worked with them. There's different uh, chapters for different topics. There's different languages. There's different uh, industries. So there's something out there for a little bit for everyone. So uh, go check that out at sequelpass.org forward slash VC. Here's some of the sessions we've got coming up. Uh, obviously kicking and screaming today. Um, in our DBA Fundamentals Down Under, uh, Tim Radney is going to be doing Understanding SQL Server Backup and Restore. Now, again, since this is uh, in Brisbane time, uh, it turns out to be about 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time on the night before. So um, that's probably April the 12th, but check your dates and be sure uh, when you register. This one, we're not so sure. Well, let me back up. Anyway. Sorry. Uh, we're not so sure about whether or not we're going to give the one with Mickey Stewie because, anyway, uh, hold off on signing up for that one. Uh, in May, uh, Jess Borland is going to be doing one on Beyond CX Packet Understanding Wake Statistics because almost uh, every time when you run um, 
some of Glenberry's uh, scripts or anybody else's scripts to get weight statistics, you're going to have CX packet in there. So they, she's going to make sure you understand some of this stuff a little bit better. It's just another key thing to work with in performance tuning. Um, Kendra Little will be giving a session in July, three skills every junior DBA must know, and she's real good. Um, if you've ever listened to her, she's very good at uh, basic things like this and getting the details across. And in August, uh, Glenn Berry will be doing one on high availability and disaster recovery 101. Here's some other virtual chapter meetings that are coming up. Uh, there's one coming up right after this session that uh, looks pretty good and, and something you might want to look at. I thought it seemed interesting um, analyzing U.S. election candidates on Facebook using Excel and Power Query presented by Gil Raviv. Uh, professional Vel Development's got one, PowerShell, Global Portuguese, I hope I said that correctly, um, Hacking SQL Server, and uh, I thought that looked pretty good. Women Technology's got a good one coming up, Tools and Tips from the Accidental to Efficient Data Warehouse Developer. Upcoming SQL Saturdays, if you've never been to a SQL Saturday, you need to check out and see if there's one going to be close to you. It's a great day of free training, uh, like a small past summit uh, that doesn't cost you anything except paying for your lunch usually. Um, you can go to www.sqlsaturday.com and check out and see what's, which one's closest here. Here's some that are coming up in North America and International. We will record our sessions and they'll be available in a couple of days. Uh, you can get them at our website. Um, and you can again, if you want to, uh, make a uh, copy of this screen. You can always have it so you can go find our sessions or you can go subscribe to our YouTube channel because that's where they wound up eventually anyway. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of a little disjointed this morning. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. Aaron is a SQL Server MVP and works with SQL skills. Uh, she lives in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, she's had 13 years of technology experience and has worked with SQL Server since 2003. We've had her here uh, at DBA Fundamentals two or three times, and she's always excellent. I'm going to turn it over to you now, Aaron. Let me pass the session back to you. There you go. Thank you, sir. Uh, all right. So everyone should be able to see my screen. And currently, I just have the first page of my slide show up. So I assume that you are all here to talk about replacing profiler with extended events. And the reason the title of this session starts with kicking and screaming is because of something like this. So if you haven't seen this post, then whenever you have time, I would love to have you go um, read it. And it's about avoiding extended events and why people avoid it. And I had an interesting discussion with some people on Twitter last week, including my friend Denny Cherry, who said, profiler for life and will remain until they rip it from my cold, dead hands. So kicking and screaming, I think, is pretty good because some folks really don't want to migrate. And here's the thing. I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong. I'm going to give you an option, right? And it's up to you as to whether you want to work with that or not. I'll present some great things along the way and I'll also let you know about some things that people find challenging. So if you've got questions, definitely ask them in the question window and I will answer them throughout. A little bit of information about me on this slide. The most important thing is my email address, Aaron at SQLSkills.com. If you have questions about this session afterwards, please feel free to email me. Uh, the other thing to note is that I am on Twitter at Aaron. Aaron Salato, feel free to say hello there. I work for SQL Skills. This is the team, Paul Randall, Kimberly Tripp. They're the owners, Glenn Berry, myself, John Cahayas. I never call him John, Jonathan Cahayas, and Tim Ratney. We provide training through our immersion events, 
uh, we also provide training online through Pluralsight. We also do consulting. We present at conferences. And if you want to hear from us on a regular basis, then please go to sqlskills.com slash insider and sign up. Here is a list of the immersion events. You can also information on our training page. And if you're interested in some more online training from us, you can email Paul directly and get a free code for Pluralsight if you haven't done that before. So I love this because I get to give out Paul's email address, paul at sqlskills.com. And in the subject line, go ahead and put user group Pluralsight code. Mention here that you are at the DBA Fundamentals group uh, session with me today. And he will send you a code for a 30-day trial. There are two courses out there from Jonathan about extended events, and I am working on a third as we speak. So here's our plan from today. for today. We're going to talk about how to transition from the UI in Profiler to extended events. We'll talk a little bit about targets in extended events, and we'll talk about potential performance issues to pay attention to. So let's start with talking about this transition that occurs. And a thing to remember is that Profiler was released with SQL Server 7. And I like to ask people, what year did SQL Server 7 come out? And it's a little harder to do this remotely, although if I could figure out how to do a poll, I would do that. But the answer is 1998. So it's 2016, which means that as of right now, Profiler is a legal adult. So we're using software that's, you know, 18 years old. Fantastic. And the thing about that is that it really hasn't improved a lot in the past few years. So extended events exists to replace Profiler because trying to make changes to that and to trace was just too much. So the SQL Server team developed extended events. And what is what are extended events? And if you look in books online, the definitions they provide are what are in quotes here. A general event handling system for server systems. and the extended events infrastructure supports the correlation of data from SQL Server. What does that really mean? It means that there's an infrastructure within SQL OS, and SQL OS was introduced in SQL Server 2005. And that infrastructure allows us to create these sessions which collect event data and review that data and use that for troubleshooting, for analysis, for understanding what's happening within SQL Server. So it allows us to get this data about what's going on and understand it. Now, you have the database engine and then you have SQL OS and within that you have the extended events engine. And that engine has some services and some objects and those then interact with other SQL Server processes. Now the objects that we talk about within SQL Server, you may have heard these before. You may have heard events and targets and predicates and actions and types and maps and packages. And there's really a hierarchy here with package at the top of that. And a package is just a grouping of events. It's basically a logical container of events, predicates, actions, targets, types, and maps. So we're going to talk through what each of these are in this first demo. Now, let me see here. There's some comments here, and I can't see the screen completely in terms of the questions, but one of the questions is, is that, is anyone else having audio issues? So, Steve, can you hear my audio okay? I was getting ready to say, uh, it, you're, you're, there's, it's, it's breaking up about once every 50 words, and I missed maybe a word or two. I was hoping it would go away, so it's cutting in and out just a little. Well, I'll be really honest and that I'm not 100% certain what I can do about that because if that's my internet connection, that's way out of my hands and I'm pretty close to my mic, so I'm not thinking that it's the microphone itself. So if I, I slow down when I talk, does that help it a little bit? That might help a tad. Uh, that's why I didn't really say anything because I was hoping it would go away. <laughs> Um, okay. Just, my problem is, is that I start to get excited and passionate about what I'm talking about, and then I start um, going really fast. So I'll try to slow down, and hopefully that will help. But if not, um, mention this in the um, chat window so you can let me know. I, I'm getting feedback that some of you can hear it just fine. So we will soldier on. We're going to hop into our demo right away because I love demos because I like to see what's happening. And the funny thing 
is that we are going to start in the tool that you know and love so much, which is Profiler. So this is probably what most of you are used to, right? The UI. And I would guess that what most of you do is you come in here and you decide to do a new trace and you connect to your instance and you probably have a template that you use. And I'm going to use one today. And the template's great because it has the events and the columns that you want to see already selected. So when I select use template and I pick my high reads template, I come in here to the events and I see that I have RPC completed, already selected, and I have SQL statement completed selected. And I have a set number of columns. If I, if I show all columns, you can see there's a bunch that I haven't selected. And if I show all events, you'll see I hate that view because now I have to start expanding to find them. But if I don't, then you can just see what I have selected here. And if I go into column filters, and I scroll down, you'll see that I have a reads filter here because ideally we always want to filter on something. Running a wide open trace against your environment, I have heard, can cause problems, can maybe cause your system to go down. So we really always want to put a filter on there. So here we're looking for reads greater than or equal to 10,000. So I would guess that most of the time once you've got your events and your columns and your filter set up, you would select run and then you would go and say stop because the profiler UI has a lot of overhead here. It can really drag down the performance of your system separate from whatever events you've set up and, and filters. Running it through the UI has a lot of overhead. So what most people hopefully do is they export this out to a script trace definition. So we're gonna just call this user group. It's been saved. And so at this point, I've stopped this. This isn't really running. And what I would do is I would come into Management Studio, and we go out to that location. And then I would take this script, which Profiler generated for me when I exported it. I put in a file location, and I could run this. Now, I'm going to take one of these that I've already created, right? It looks like out. And, and I want to step through this because the thing is, no one goes, no one that I've met yet, there may be someone out there, but no one that I've met yet goes in and creates these things from scratch, right? Nobody goes in and writes them, but it's important to understand what they're doing. So this script, and this will only take a minute, so bear with me. This script first starts by creating a queue. It defines a trace ID, a max file size, and it sets that here. And then the next thing we have is our SP trace create function, which uses that trace ID. It's going to output a value for that. We specify the location for where we want the file to go. In this case, it's C temp, and I have it called remote UG. UG. You don't have to put the .trc on there. It tells you that right up there. And then after that, you'll see we do this set the events. So we execute this SP trace set event, and there's a combination of numbers here which is a event and column combination, right? And this is the stuff that nobody memorizes, right? I use books online for this. And the only reason I have these here is it's so that we know, so that I know that 10 is RPC completed and one is text data. Oh, don't switch that around. And 10 and nine is RPC completed and client process ID. So these get set, those event column combinations get set using SP trace set event. And the the more events and columns that I have, the more there will be of these. Now, I only have two. So I have RPC completed, and I have SQL statement completed. Once all of those are set, then I have my filter. And remember, I just had the one. I had my big int filter here, which is, oops, this one down here, which is my reads greater than or equal to 10,000. And then the last thing that happens is SP trace set status, which starts the trace. So if I execute this, we get a trace ID of two, which is expected, assuming we don't have any other traces running, because the default trace is running, and that typically starts up very first and has a trace ID of one. So we get a trace ID of two. And at, that, at this point, it's running in the system. And I can use FN trace get info to see what's running. Right, here's my default trace. Here's the one that I created. And I can use SP trace set status to stop the trace. And I can use, if I would highlight correctly, I could do that anyway. And then I can use SP trace set status to remove the definition entirely. So at this point, everything's gone. If I run FN trace get info again, right, it's completely been removed from the system. Now, 
this is what we're used to, right? We're used to using that UI. We're used to scripting this out. We're used to running this. This takes, you know, a minute maybe for us to do. So now I'm going to tell you that you can do all of this with extended events. And I will tell you that initially it's going to take you some time. And that may be your biggest barrier because when I go back to this blog, Aaron, we've totally lost you. Post that I wrote, and I look at the comments, and I would definitely encourage you to look. Hello. We totally lost you there for Hello? a second. Can you hear me? Am I back? Yes, I you're can. back. Can you hear me? Yes, you're back now. We totally lost okay. you there when you Where went did back you... to the blog screen with Dini, Mr. Dini. Fascinating. Fascinating. Am I there still? Yes, you're fine now. Okay. Okay, so I won't go to, to the blog post again. No offense to Denny. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing is, is that I got a lot of comments on that. And, and one of the biggest things, and, I, and I'm collecting data, I want us to understand what the challenge is. And one of the biggest challenges is time. And so I'll tell you that from the outset. Right? If you've been using Profile and Trace, you're very used to this. You can do this in your sleep. You can do it without really thinking about it. Going to extended events will take you time. That's just the case, right? There's a startup cost, a startup time associated with learning extended events. But if you, if you force yourself to use it, if you commit to using it, you can get just as good as it with as you are with Profiler and Trace. You just have to commit to doing that. I understand that not everybody has that, but I'll tell you that it's absolutely possible. Now, how do I take this? How do I take this trace and how do I get over to extended events? There's a UI for extended events, and we're going to get to that. But I wouldn't tell you to start there. I would tell you to start with this trace that you have, the one that you run most often, and then use this stored procedure. It's SP SQL skills convert trace to extended events, and it does exactly what it says. Jonathan wrote. Aaron, we've lost you. This on a plane once. I'm not going to go through it in great detail. Am I back now? Yes. It sounds like Hello? things are, are buffering and coming back real quickly. So that is probably just the connection. So. Okay. I don't know that I have any ability to control that. You don't. Uh, on so my side. What we'll do is it will continue, and if there's anything left out, you're always amiable to letting people blog and uh, sending you requests, I'm sure. so. I am. I'm really sorry about that, guys. I'm not sure what's causing that issue. Um, but we will soldier on, and hopefully you all will be patient with me. So I was saying that this is a stored procedure that Jonathan created, and it's a stored procedure that you can use to convert a trace that you have already set up over to extended events. And that's what we're going to do here. So I already have this store procedure installed. Here is my trace. I'm going to go ahead and stop. And now I get the error that it can't create the file. And that's because the file already exists there. So I have to remove it because I wasn't dynamically naming it. So there it is. And now I'm going to run this store procedure. In order to run the store procedure after I've created it, I need to take the trace ID as the input. So the trace ID, if you remember, is two. So we'll input that. And then I need to specify the session name, which I'm going to use XE reads filter trace. And then I need to print my output because I want to see what it's going to do. And then we're going to execute that. I'm going to just run this. I don't want to execute it. So execute is zero. Now, while this is running, I am looking at, do I have the option to call into this or do I have to do this in voice over IP? I have to do it over voice over IP, don't I? Okay. So here is the script that it generates. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new window and drop this in here. So this is our event session definition, which the script creates for me automatically. Now, right now, let me tell you that this only works for SQL Server 2012 and higher. If you're running SQL Server 2008 
or SQL Server 2008 R2, my recommendation is to keep using Trace and Profiler. And the reason is because they're not all of the events from Trace have a comparable event in extended events until 2012. And there's no UI for extended events until 2012. So if you're on 2008, 2008 R2, don't be sad, right? This is getting you ready for what's coming. But I would stay with Trace and with Profiler. Now you can use it. You can use extended events. It's just going to take you a little bit extra work. And some people are all in and they definitely want to do that. And I can talk about how to do that. But this script is for 2012 and higher. So let me take a copy of this script that I have commented here. And we're going to look at that side by side. Not that way. Side by side. I hate it when I do that. Open it again. I want a vertical tab group. There we go. We're going to look at that next to my trace. We had this create a queue. And in the beginning of my event session, there's some additional code that Jonathan put in here, which is a check to see if the event session already exists and if it does, drop it. So this is just something that his code has added. The extended events code starts right here with create event session on server. So these event sessions are specific to the instance, just like your traces were. So with profiler with trace, we create a queue. With extended events, we create an event session. Now, with our trace, we had our file location specified. I want you to hold on to that thought, right? Just park that for the moment. We're going to come back to it. The next thing we did was we set our events. We did our event and column combinations here. Within extended events, you'll see we have add event SQL Server.RPC completed. So the thing that I love is that I can read this, right? RPC completed. I know exactly what event we are adding. Great. Then I have this action section. And some of you may notice that the list of actions that I have does not let match the list of columns that I have over here. And this is a fundamental difference between trace and extended events. With trace, when you selected an event, it captured all of those columns that show up in Profiler by default, right? If I come back here and I look at my events and I say show all the columns, it collected all of those even though I didn't have them checked because the way that trace works is it grabs the event and all of this information. And then when it gets down to the, to the end, it says, oh, you only wanted these? Okay, I'm going to throw the rest away. So there's overhead, right, that happens in that situation. Extended events, more efficient here. Every event has a default payload. It has a default set of fields that it's capturing. So you'll notice that in this list, we don't see duration. In this list, we don't see reads or writes or CPU. And that's because those things are part of that default payload. And I'll show you where you can see that in the UI. So what are these actions then? This is something additional that you're asking SQL Server to collect. So you're going to want to start to think about these a little bit more carefully because rather than just already having all this information and tossing out what it doesn't need like in Trace, Extended Events has some information and if you want more, it's going to have to go get it. So do I really need server instance name? Do I really need server principal name? Maybe, maybe not. But these are actions. After my actions, I have my predicate. I have my where clause. And if we scroll down in our trace window, right here at our filter, where I set my filter to be reads greater than or equal to 10,000. Here, I have this in somewhat more readable format, where logical reads greater than or equal to 10,000. And then I move on with add event. So each event is added separately, just like it was in trace. Each event has its own default payload. And each event can have have its own actions. These don't have to be the same. They are, in my case, but they don't have to be. And each event has its own predicate, which is very different than trace. In trace, this predicate applied to all events. In extended events, I can apply different predicates to different events. So I have a ton more flexibility. 
at the end of this event session definition, I have this target. My target is where do I want the data to go? Since I'm starting from a trace, I'm going to put the data the same place that I would for a trace, which a target being the event file. So you'll see add target event file, and then I'm specifying where I want this to go, the max file size, the max rollover file. Just like I did for trace. Now I have different targets available in extended events, but this right here, this file target, is analogous to writing out to a file with trace. So if I want to go ahead and run both of these, which I had this one running, right? And I want to stop it real quick. And I need to remove this file again. And then I want to start these both up at the same time. But this time, I'm going to comment out my predicate because I don't want to worry about generating that much I.O. Steve, how has my sound been? A um, few people have mentioned that uh, when you move around the screen real fast, it seems mm -hmm. to scramble it a little bit. And it just buffers it and slows it down. So the only thing you can maybe do is slow down just a little bit. And I'm sure that's uh, hard. Mm -hmm. but no, other it's than that, okay. it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Keep going. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and start up my trace. And then let's go ahead and create my event session. Now, one of the things here is that I create the event session. But it doesn't start. This is something that's different. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and close both of the those. And if you're wondering about these scripts and if they'll be available, they will. Yes, that's another question. I figured you had so them to see what skills. I yeah to see what I have. <laughs> um, I'll make them available. Yeah, for download from the SQL Skills site. So if I want to see what exists for extended events. I can run this first query, which is against server event sessions. And for trace, I'm running fn trace get info. So here I can see that I have system health and I have always on health. And these are event sessions that get created by default in your installation. System health has been there since SQL Server 2008. If you're running 2008, you have a system health session. It doesn't start writing out to an event file until 2012. The always on health event session was added in 2012 and is only going to be running if you're using an availability group. Now this is the event session that I added, XE reads filter trace. For the trace output, I've got my default trace and I have my trace that I created. If I want to start my event session, this is the syntax. Alter event session on server state equals start. So I have to create it and then I have to start it. My trace has already been started using the SP trace set status, passing in my trace ID and setting it to one. So let's go ahead and start my event session. And then what I need to do is I need to start running some queries. So this, this may be what, this may cause more of a problem here. We'll see what happens when I do this. And I'm not a PowerShell guru, by the way. Sometimes I get error messages in here. Um, I don't worry about them too much, but I'm gonna let this run just for a minute here to capture some data. And once I've done that, I can come back and I can look to see what's running using server event sessions again and joining over to DMXE sessions. And for my traces, I can use sys.traces. So if I run these two queries, I can see that my XE session has been running, and I can see that my trace is running. Now if I want to stop these, I'm going to run alter event session on server, state equals stop, and for trace, I'll run SP trace set status and set it to zero. So this is how I stop both of those. And then if I want to remove the definition entirely, which is probably what you typically did with trace, I can do trace set status and set it to two. And for the event session, I can use drop event session. But I'm gonna make a point here. Most people probably created traces, ran them, and then stopped them and dropped them. With your event sessions, you don't have to drop them when you're done. They persist between restarts. So what I tend to do in my customer environments and in my environments when I'm working with things is I create event sessions and I start and stop them as needed but I leave them there. 
so that I don't have to go recreate it from scratch every time. Now, some folks have said, well, I can't do that. That's not easy for me. Um, sometimes I'm working with a developer, and when I walk over to their desk, I don't have that script with me. I get it. It's a different way to get things done. But it's definitely possible because you can script all of this out just like I've done, save those, and share them with your friends. Now, what does this data look like? Let's open up this file. All right, now this is the view that we know and love. And this means, probably for most of you, that if you want to do any kind of analysis in this window, you're going to scroll a lot. Um, I can reorder the columns, true. I can filter this down to a different result set, true. I can find, true. But that's really about it. If I want to do any kind of analysis on this, I either need to push this to a table, which is probably what a lot of people did, right? Save as trace table, and you might be nodding out there. Okay. Um, some of you may have taken these files and processed them through either clear trace or read trace or cure. Those are all free tools. If you're running 2008 R2 and below and you're using trace and you've been pushing stuff to a table, I'll tell you now, go look at clear trace. Low footprint, free tool, very easy to use because you can't do a lot here. So what happens if we take the file that extended events created, which is this? Now, one of the things you might notice is that, that I had given this file a name of XE reads filter trace, but I have all this stuff after it. Well, remember when I created my trace and then I stopped it and I tried to start it again and I got an error because the file was already there? That's because with trace, you can't have the same file name, right? It has to be dynamically named. This is true across Windows in general. But I had to dynamically manage that name somehow. I don't have to do that anymore with extended events because the engine does that for me. Because it appends these numbers, which is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1700, to when you start it, so that each file gets uniquely named on its own. You don't have to worry about that, which is pretty cool. So I can take this file and I just drag it it into Management Studio. Now in 2008 and 2008 R2, when you did an event file, it would actually create two files. You can view those in the 2012 UI as well. So now that I have this in the UI, this is really impressive, right, compared to Profiler. Well, not yet, but I can get this view and I can get it completely customized. So when I highlight the event, I can come down here to the Details pane and I can say, okay, I want to add the database ID, and I want to add the logical reads, and I also want to add my statement, and then I can expand this out. And I could do this by right-clicking on each column in the details panel, or I could go up to choose columns, and I can select the columns here, right, and then move them around. So that's kind of fun. And what's even better is that once I get this into a view that I like, I can save it. So I can say save as, and I can save this as my desk, on my desktop, and I can call it right my favorite view. And then I can share those with my friends as well. So I don't have to reconstruct that every single time I go in and I look at data. I just set the view up once and save it, and then when I want to go back to it, I open that file. Now what else can I do in here? I can filter way more easier than I could in the trace view. I could filter based on a time span, or I can filter based on session ID. I could filter based on duration, right? I can definitely do that. Duration greater than one. And I say, okay, and that goes ahead and applies that. And you'll notice this, right? That, that only got rid of four events. Enter on there, it's gonna change this, so it's gonna tell me how many events it's displaying. And if I didn't like that filter, I could go back in and I could change it. Let's make that 10. Let's say OK. Still not hitting a lot. Obviously, I need to drop things down a little bit. I can find, just like I could before, right? If I want to look for the text of product in my statement, I can absolutely do that. Not produce. Apparently, I'm hungry. But let's try product. There we go. I can do that as well. The other thing I can do in here, which is kind of cool, is I can sort. So I click on duration, and now I have these.
sorted in a much better order. You can add, if I come up here under extended events, I can export and I can export this to a table. So if you absolutely love writing that T-SQL and doing all that manipulation with your T-SQL, then knock yourself out. You can absolutely do that. But I tell you, I tend to do everything here in the UI. So let me hop back to my slides. And as I do that, I want to see if I can find anything, any questions so far. I've got questions about audio, which I'm trying to slow down. Hopefully it's better. Earlier on, someone asked if uh, when uh, SQL Upgrade Advisor and Database Engine Tuning Advisor could use extended events instead of traces, if you knew about that. Mm, that's a great question. Right now, no. I don't know where that is in the product in terms of if that, how they're working to change that, but I will look into that. So that's a good question. Thank you. I thought that was a good one. I agree. Okay. So. Hang on one second. And I'm just looking through, um, looking at the comments. I, I have like as little running on my machine as possible, and I have improved my internet connection recently. So I don't know what's going on. Yeah, All right, it's hard, so let's it's hard to, back. It's hard to find the legitimate questions. <laughs> right, okay. So let's talk a little bit about events, because I've, I've thrown that word around a lot. In an event, is a well-known point in the code. So if you think of these as some things we see in the default trace, a data file has to auto grow, or we get a sort warning in a query, or there's an object created, or a statement completed, or a lock acquired, or a recompile, or a deadlock graph. Those are different events that exist within SQL Server. And if we look at what these look like in trace versus extended events, you can see that the team did a pretty good job of trying to keep the names the same, right? SP colon statement completed becomes SP underscore statement underscore completed. SQL statement comply, com recompile, blah, blah, blah. I have an asterisk next to database file size changed because the data file auto grow at one point was split out into two different events, which was a data file grow and a log file grow. And then they added this event, database file size changed, which tracks both log and data growths. So if you're interested in looking at that, note that that's the event that you need. In trace, we had our deadlock graph. In extended events, we have our XML deadlock report. And by the way, the XML deadlock report is captured by default in the system health session. Now, you could set up a separate event session to capture them, but they're there by default in the system health session. Now let's look at the number of events that exist per version of SQL Server, right? Extended events was released with 2008, and at that time, as of SP3, there's 253 events. In R2, we got a few more events, and then by SP1 of 2012, or really by the 2012 event release, we were over 600. And my note here is that every event that's in trace has a comparable event in extended events as of 2012. And you'll see that the number of events just keeps increasing. And my note here is how many events do you think there are for trace in every single one of these versions? The answer is a whopping 180. And that's not going to change. So some people may think, well, you know what, the events that are there work just fine for me and that's what I need. I get it. I really do. Understand that the comparable event does exist in extended events. And if you're looking to troubleshoot specific features and functionality that have been added in 2012 and higher, you're only going to find events for those in extended events. So if you're looking at column store, in-memory OLTP, buffer pool extensions, Anything like that, those events are only in extended events. So just something to be aware of. Now, again, I mentioned that events have a default payload, which is a set of fields that they're returning. And you can't change that. 
kind of. That's what the little asterisk is for. I'll show this when we get into the UI. Um, there are some that you can flip on and off, but you can't change fundamentally what it's collecting. Our predicates are where clause, right? And this is a filter. It decides or it determines whether or not that event is going to fire. And we still want to set up filters for our events in extended events, just like we did in trace. And they're really cool because they support short circuit evaluation, which means that within a predicate block, when I have something that evaluates to false, then the evaluation immediately stops occurring. For example, let's say I had something like database ID equals five and duration greater than 10 seconds. Well, if I wrote that in that order, database ID greater equal five and uh, duration greater than 10 seconds, every time that the database ID is five, then it has to go to the next one to check the duration. So if the database ID of five is the most used database on my system, it's going to have to drop all the way through that logic every single time. Whereas if I reverse the order and I said duration greater than 10 seconds and database ID equals five, then the moment that it found that the duration wasn't greater than 10 seconds, it immediately drops out. It short circuits. It says I'm done. It doesn't even look at database ID. That's a good thing. It's a really cool thing. And the thing about predicates is you can set them up for either that default payload data or on these global predicate fields, which are other things that aren't part of the default payload, but they're other fields that you can filter on. The thing to note about predicates is that sometimes they'll have the same names as the actions, such as a duration or a database ID, but they are not the same things. So understand that data that predicates and actions are two different things. And if you filter on something that isn't part of the default payload, like when we looked at our RPC completed, reads, writes, duration, CPU, those were all part of the default payload, which means the event is pulling that information in by default. If I wanted to filter on something else, like the login name, right, the engine has to go get that information first, and then it can do predicate evaluation. So it's important to understand kind of how that works behind the scenes. So there are cases where what you're getting in the default payload isn't everything that you need, and that's where we need our actions. So the action is an additional operation that SQL Server performs, like collecting the database ID or collecting the session ID or creating a dump file for the current thread. Some of these actions are, I don't want to say benign, but they're you know, pretty acceptable. Creating a dump file for the whole server, maybe not be. So one of the things to be careful with is, is when using those actions, understanding what that, action does, what, that, what that action does. The action only executes when the event fires, so only if the predicate evaluates to true. So think about what actions you really need, because some of them have serious side effects, and the more that you have um, can introduce more overhead, and select actions like T-SQL stack, T-SQL frame, can have higher overheads than something like database ID. And then the last thing to mention here is our target. The target consumes the event, right? This is where our data goes. So it can go to an event file, which it exists out on disk, so you can think of that as quote unquote permanent. Whereas the other ones that I have here, the ring buffer, the event counter, the histogram, and event pairing targets, those four targets are all memory resident. So only when this event session is running can you see that data. Now you can save it off before you stop the event session, but it's a memory resident target as opposed to a disk-based target. So here's a big picture. Right? If we think about the order of events and extended events, if the events encountered, check to see is enabled. Right? Am I supposed to be collecting this for an event session? And if that's true, then continue on in my collection mode. Collect that default payload data. Then do the predicate evaluation. And here, if I'm uh, evaluating something that isn't part of the default payload, it has to go get that. If it's true, publish the event, fire the event. Then execute the actions. Again, 
actions only get executed if the predicate evaluates to true. For any target that's synchronous, which is just event counter, serve up that data. Otherwise, what happens is that event data gets buffered into or gets pushed into some memory buffers, which is kind of like an intermediate location in SQL Server's memory where it sits until it gets dispatched out to the target. So if I have a memory resident target, the data still goes to other memory buffers first and then goes to my memory resident target. Or if it goes out to a file target, it's in memory first and then it goes out to my file target out on disk. Now, let's go back to the UI so that you can see how to create the event session there. So we'll come back here, we'll close this, and we will open up a script just so that I have this available. Um, an event session, I may not do this one, I may just wing this one. So within Management Studio, 2012 and higher connected to a 2012 engine underneath management extended events sessions I have the sessions here yes it's more clicks than if I open up profiler but it's really not that hard to find and from my session I can right click and I can do new session wizard or I can select new session now I like new session because the new session wizard doesn't give me everything I get everything in new session so here it is, this is my screen. And I first need to create, um, or excuse me, specify a name. So we'll call this one DB use. And I do have templates here. Just like I do in Trace, I have templates within extended events. And these are the ones that come through by default, but I can create my own if I want, if there's something that I tend to do a lot. I have the option of starting the event session when the server starts. So you could do this with Trace by like setting up a store procedure to start it or by setting up an agent job. I don't have to do that. I can control that all within the event session definition. So I can have the event session start every time the instance starts and it'll just keep running. I can also have it start right after I create it here and then watch live data. The other event option that's pretty neat is this thing called causality tracking or in this version, causality tracking, because there's a slight typo, but it's fixed in 2016. And the option here is track how events are related to one another. So you know how in Trace sometimes you'd be like, okay, I need the transaction ID, and I need the session ID, and I need something else, because I'm trying to understand all these events that happened in a particular transaction in the order. You don't have to do that anymore, because causality tracking will do that for you. It attaches a GUID and an an order ID basically to the events that are part of a transaction, which is kind of cool. Then I've got my events. So these are all, all the different events that I have available. Notice that if I come here under channel, debug is not selected. So by default, I'm only seeing admin, analytical, and operational events. If I want to see the debug events, I have to check that box. There's no way to change that. But most of the time, you don't need the debug events. Here's one of the things that I love. How much time did you spend in Profiler in this window? Show my all my events. Hold on. File new trace in here. Event selection. Show all events. I don't know about you guys, but I could never remember where certain events were. Now, maybe I wasn't using it enough, but I hated this. I, I did this a lot. Check, uncheck, scroll, mm, lost hours in that window. No more. Here, I can just type completed, and I see every event that has completed. Like, this makes me want to do, like, a touchdown dance, right? Like, hallelujah. So easy to find these events. Now, what did I want to set up here? I want to look at the lock acquired event. So let's come back here. I can just type lock, and if that's not enough, I can type acquired, and here we go. I have the lock acquired event. Now down here in the bottom, this is my default payload. This is the information that I get by default with this event. So I'm gonna highlight this, and I'm gonna move this over to my list of events. Now, this is my one beef with the UI. And it's really not huge and it gives 
opportunity to make a cool sound. I can't see all of my event options in this window. There's just not enough real estate. So I have to hit this configure button. And when I do, it's like a, a cool PowerPoint um, transition, right? Voop, there we go, it slides over. So I still have my event here, and now I have these events configuration options over on the other side. My global fields action, my filter, my predicate, and then my event fields. So if I wanna go back and add more events, I just whoop, go back across. Hopefully you'll make that sound at work and people will think you're crazy. So once I have my event, I can again go to this event fields tab and I can look to see what the default payload is. And remember I said that you can't change it and then I said, well, that's kind of not true. This is what I meant by that's kind of not true. I have database name and I have resource description and they have these check boxes and they're not checked, which means that by default, these aren't gonna get pulled but if I want them to, I can. So their default payload optional is the way you can think of them. Now, if I wanna set a filter here, I can do, do that and we're going to, and I'm gonna cheat and use my little notes over here. So my filter is gonna be kind of complex. I'm gonna say my owner type is a shared transaction workspace and my resource here is a database lock. Because what I wanna do actually with this event session is I wanna look to see which databases are really in use in my environment. And I can look at my shared transaction workspace um, database locks to understand that. Now, I only care about my user databases. So we're gonna say database ID is greater than four. And I only care about user processes, right? I don't care about system processes. So here's my is system. Nope, I only want user. And notice that I have and here, right? So I want it to be a shared transaction workspace type, um, a database resource type, database ID greater than four, and not a system. But these are all ands. But I could change these. I could make them ors. And you'll see, right, if you understand logic, that these can become quite complex and quite interesting. We're gonna keep it pretty simple here. The other thing is, do I want to capture any uh, um, additional information? Are there any actions that I need here? And in this case, I don't, but if I did, this is where I would select those global fields, but I'm good for now. Then I need to decide, where am I gonna put this data? What's my target? So I can select event counter, I can select file, histogram, pair matching. I'm gonna stick with my um, event file here and, and I can specify where I want this to go. Notice that in 2014, it just puts a name here. It doesn't give you a full path. It's going to the log directory for SQL Server, right? Where the error log is, where the default trace goes. I can change it though. I can write that somewhere else. Specify my maximum file size, file rollover. How many files do I want? Great. Then I've got my advanced tab and for the majority of the time, the defaults on the advanced tab are fine. Event retention mode, single event loss is fine. Note that there's a not recommended for no event loss. Um, the dispatch latency, if you remember that slide, this is how long it takes for it to get from the intermediate buffers out to the target, 30 seconds is fine. Max memory size, I tend to bump this up to something like 16 megs, and this is just for those intermediate buffers. And I leave the memory partition node at none. And at that, that point, my event session exists. So let's pin this up here. And so if I come back here and I refresh, right here is the event session that I created. And from here, I can right click and I can start my session. So now that event session is running. Let's see if I can create some data here. Where's my demo two? Demo two, run demo two real quick. Hopefully all these scripts run because I'm not a PowerShell guru. Yay, they look good. Now. I can watch live data, which means that I can get a profiler-like view of this information. And it takes sometimes a little bit of time for it to pop up in this window. But there we go. I can see the different locks that are being acquired. And I can just let this come in just like I could with profiler. Or at some point if I wanted to, I could stop the data feed, which doesn't mean I've stopped the event session, but I can stop the feed of data and I can start to play with this, right? So I can show the database ID in the table and then maybe I wanted to understand, okay, what database has a lot of connections? I can group by this column. 
ah, looks like database ID 7 is pretty popular. I can add something like, let's see, duration isn't going to be in here, but there it is. I can do aggregates on this as well. I can do an, uh, an aggregate, right, give me the max duration or give me the total duration. I can do a lot of analysis here in this window, which is pretty cool. Let's see. Okay, Steve, I haven't, like, checked to see how, am I, how I am with questions. I don't know why this question window. Oh, this is what I needed to do. Okay. Do I think that the system health is a useful extended event session? Yes, I do. So let's just take a look at system health, which is sitting here and it's running. Uh, right click, look at the properties of it. It's capturing some events that I don't necessarily love, but it is capturing the XML deadlock report. It is capturing wait info, which I've used this uh, system health event session and looked to see uh, the wait info for a customer when they were all of a sudden having these issues. And I determined that the waits were coming from TempDB because they were running into uh, temp, TempDB contention. So I absolutely think that system health is useful. Jonathan's got a good blog post about using it. Somebody asked what NB means. This is from my slides. NB is uh, Latin for note bene, which means note well. So where did I have that there, NB actions? No things about this. Um, am I able to say on average the difference in resource usage between an extended event profiler is equivalent to trace versus profiler? So if you think about profiler, which is the UI, you think about trace, what a server side trace, which doesn't involve the UI, which is just that script that writes out to a file, and you think about an extended event session. Jonathan has actually written a blog post that has this, and I don't want to switch to uh, my browser just in case, but if you Google um, Jonathan Cahayas trace versus extended per events performance, you'll see that when you run a pro, when you run profiler, when you run that UI, the overhead that that introduces is significantly worse. It's not a good thing. I don't recommend running that UI. Run a server side trace or run the extended event session. The performance between the trace and the event session, pretty comparable for the same set of events actions, etc. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there an extended event to monitor index rebuild status? Well, I don't think so, but you know what? Here's one of the really cool things that we can do. I can come in here to the properties. I can look at the events and I can search, right? So if I look at index, index build extends allocation. This is kind of interesting. Tells me about new extents being allocated during a build. Ah, progress report online index operation. So can I monitor an online? Yes. Offline doesn't look like it, but there's something. So there's an event for that. Ah, uh, here's one of my favorite questions. Is it possible to combine the perfmon logs with extended event logs to make the correlation between Windows and event session data. So if you remember, you could come in here within your within profiler and say import performance data and you could import a perfmon file. I'll tell you right now, no, you cannot do that in extended events. But I've seen a fair number of people request it. The the story is is that the SQL server team actually didn't even know that trace had that capability. So they did not add that into extended events. Now can it be added in? I don't know for sure, but I think it's probably going to be worth creating a connect item and upvoting that and see what happens. Um, is there a way to see live events like in Profiler? Yes, I showed you how to do that. Any challenges in migrating extended events script inversions? You only want to use 2012 and higher to migrate your trace script to uh, the extended event script. Does the order of the predicates matter? Yes. Can you download the scripts? Yes. Um, let's see. There was one other question. There was I'm one. It for the moment. There was one uh, where somebody was asking if uh, key events needed on Azure's SQL DB version 12 uh, to support extended events. Extended events is available in the current Azure environment. I don't know how the events differ, but remember that Azure is always ahead of the box at this point. So if you're looking to see what events are coming in extended events. 
you'll probably find them in Azure before you find them in one of the release candidates, right? We're on RC2 now. Um, so let's see. So I've definitely run out of time, which is so not uncommon when I present. So, so let, me, let me hop through a couple of things here. Um, actually, let me just escape this for a second. And I want to point out a couple of things. You still need to think about performance with extended events. There are some events which are still expensive, like the execution show plan. So some of you know that in Trace, you can capture the actual plan for a query. You can do this within extended events, but I'm going to show you something. Within this query, post execution show plan, notice that Microsoft tells you using this event can have significant performance overhead, so it should only be used when troubleshooting or monitoring specific. Do not, please, please set this up as an event in uh, an, an event session that you run all the time because there's significant overhead that comes with it. Um, if you filter on the global state data, there's overhead there, right? If you're not filtering on the default payload, but something else. If you add actions, that adds overhead. Um, and even though you've got maybe tons of memory on that server, you need to set limits. And this is, this is really specific to using the ring buffer target, which we didn't even have time to get to today. Um, I can talk about extended events for hours, as you've probably guessed by now. Um, this was just the beginning to get you going. Um, here's a few things that you probably won't love, which I get, which is why I talk about them. It's going to feel like it takes longer to create an event session than it does to set up a trace. And it does initially it's going to take you longer to do everything initially because there's a learning curve. So if you want to use extended events, it's one of those things that you have to decide that you're going to use and just commit and do it. That's it. You can't integrate the Perfmon data with XE data. Um, the histogram target, which we didn't get to talk about, you can only bucket on one field, and distributed replay still requires trace files. But it is my understanding that they're working on changing that. The things that I love about extended events, and there's a lot, not just what's on this slide, you can create multiple event sessions and just start them and stop them as needed, right? And my client environments, when I go into Management Studio, there's a whole bunch of sessions right here underneath this, and I just start and stop them as I need to. Um, I have the search capability in the events. I can't tell you how much time I've gotten back in my life for that. I can use the track causality. I can write to multiple targets. Again, I talked about the event file mostly, but I could write to an event file and I could also write out to a histogram. So I can capture data in multiple locations. And I now have a UI to work with the data. I don't have to push it to a table and write T-SQL. I don't have to use a third-party tool. It's all within Management Studio. So when you're back in the office, or if you're still in the office, but when you run into an issue, here are some ideas. Right? When you want to go to use Trace, if you're on 2012 and higher, set aside 50 minutes to try what you want in extended events. Or get the Trace, use Jonathan's script to convert it, and then spend 15 minutes playing with extended events. Use the resources that I'm going to reference here in a minute. Ask for help. And if you're struggling, I want to know. So that blog post that I showed you at the beginning, why do you avoid extended events? If you give it a go and have a problem, I want to know why. Right? Because Maybe there's something that needs to be added to the product, or maybe there's just a piece of information that I didn't share that would really help you. Here are the resources. You've got the Pluralsight code. If you get it from Paul, John has an introduction course out there and an advanced. There's seven hours of content on extended events out on Pluralsight. I am in the process of taking this session and more and putting that up on Pluralsight as well. I've got uh, a stairway started on SQL Server Central that goes through this. Um, I've got two posts out there. There's two in the pipe, and then I'm working on the rest of them. John's got 31 days of extended events, talking about the UI. There's stuff on TechNet, et cetera. So hopefully that gets you all started. Thank you guys for hanging in there with me today. I apologize about the sound issues. I have some questions in here. I'm going to go through and try to answer them. I understand it's after our end time. If you can't stay, I totally get it, but I will try to answer some questions here. Um, are there changes other than the type over the new session tab in 2016? There are additional events. There's no other fundamental changes in terms of actions or predicates, but there's additional events. Um, 
why bump up why bump up the event session buffer to 16 meg so back in here when we were looking at the event session and I was looking at advanced I pushed this value up to 16 megs um, this is just that intermediate space where the events are sitting before they get pushed out um, I do that to try to reduce the potential for the event loss because those events get dispatched either when the buffers get full or when that dispatch latency gets re reached. And depending upon what events I'm collecting and the predicates I have, I could be getting a flood of events. And so my bumping up memory there is 16 megs is giving SQL Server a better chance to not lose events. 16 megs on even a 64 gig server isn't that much. Um, I, don't send I don't tend to set it to anything higher than that. Um, is there any contraindications for other amounts? Uh, I don't quite understand that question. Um, why does extended event session doesn't write the event data captured to the event file until it is stopped? It actually is writing out to the event file, but I think what you're seeing is that when I start this up, this is my session that writes out to the event file. If I go and I look at C temp, right, and am I viewing all of my information? What happens is that this is running and it looks like there's no information, even though I have uh, scripts running. It is being written there. And you know how you know? Because if I expand this and I look at event file and I right click and I say view target data, this is going to show me what's already been written out to the file. And if I open this, oh, it hasn't dispatched yet because of my 30 seconds. That's fantastic. Let's try it again. There we go. This is what exists out in the event file target. But notice it's still sitting here at 0 KB. So it's there. It's just that the size doesn't increment. I don't know why that is. If that's a problem that really bugs people, then maybe we need to um, create that as a connect item. But the data is getting written there. Um, is there something in Always On Health that will tell you if your servers failed over? Um, there are events in there that you can track. If you're looking for a notification, I wouldn't use extended events to send you a notification that you had a failover. Um, what, practice, what best practice do you recommend in regards to extended events? That would be the last set of slides that I mentioned right here, right? Considering performance, Uh, looking at the actions that hang on where was that slide this these are the best practices that I would pay attention to right understand that specific events are expensive understand that filtering on something other than the default payload adds overhead so think carefully about what you're filtering on about what actions that you're, you're adding um, can you convert trace ID 1 to an extended event session using a store procedure yeah I'm sure you can I've never tried it but I'm pretty sure it would work but no that when I create a new session and I go to the template of activity tracking, this activity tracking template is the same as the default trace, right? It tells you right there. It's similar to the default trace. Um, let's see. In the future, is there a scope of integrating extended events with Perfmont? I don't know. Um, Connect might be the way to do that. Can I summarize profiler to extended events? Hmm. Well, this tool was introduced in SQL Server 7. I can't do really thorough analysis within the UI. I have more overhead when I use this UI here as opposed to running a server-side trace. And the way that Profiler works is that it captures all of the information for the event and then it filters out what you don't want. And every time I restart the instance, I lose any trace definitions. With extended events, I have a lot more events. It was introduced in SQL Server 2008. Um, I can create my event sessions and leave them here and start and stop them as needed. I can do my analysis within the UI. I don't need a third-party tool. If you use 2008, 2008 R2 and you want to look at the data, you would have to know XML or X events, which is why I tell you, or excuse me, XML or X query, which is why I recommend waiting until 2012. The overhead of the event session is comparable to a server-side trace, but it's way less than running Profiler. So I hope that's a good summary. That was just kind of off the top of my head. Um, 
let's see. I will not send the URL for the recording, but it will be available either on the DBA Fundamentals virtual chapter page or on the YouTube channel. Um, I think that's it for the moment. So if you've got other questions, definitely send me an email. Thank you all for attending today. Steve, I don't know if you want to say anything else. No, that's fine. Just that was a great, great session, even with uh, the the little audio issues. And <clears throat> I did find out from a couple of people that there is supposed to be an option for dialing in. I'll know next time. I do do not know how to do that now, but I will find it out. So uh, just in no case worries. this happens. But anyway, it was a great session, and um, we'll be posting the uh, recording in the next day or two. And Aaron showed you the links I'll, I'll send a link to the recording so you'll have that and you can get to the uh, downloads at SQL skills and I recommend to definitely go through and go into plural site since you've got it for free for a month and try it out you can get a ton of information out there about extended events uh, as she pointed out so you sh you have your plenty of capabilities to do that now as well as a ton of other things to talk about not just extended events Anyway, thanks, Aaron, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks, everyone.